If you want to support The Missing Witches Project, you can do so by buying our book, reviewing it on Amazon and Goodreads, using offer code MISSINGWITCHES when you shop at Foxglove Farm, become a Patreon patron, or pick up some Missing Witches merch at TeePublic. You aren't being a proper woman, therefore you must be a witch. You must be a witch. Welcome! Star goody to the Missing Witches podcast. Our listeners who have been longtime listeners will have heard your name. Um, I discovered your work while I was researching Maria Gimbutas. Mm -hmm. So we'll get into that. But listeners, you might recognize Star Goody from the Goddess in Art series that I discovered in this journey of discovery and just absolutely fell in love with. I know many of you have written to me to tell me that you've been binging the series since we (laughs) discovered it together. Um, So welcome, welcome. Oh my goodness, Star Goody. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself beyond what we already know? Well, of course, I don't know what you know, but <laughs> I get, what I want to say is there's been a thread in my life, and the thread of my life is to serve the great mother. I'll be a feminist to my last breath, but that is the thread of my life, and sometimes that unfolds over the decades. And it started when I went to Berkeley, uh, I drove across the Bay Bridge. I was raised in a little town on the peninsula and I went to Berkeley and I found the world where I belonged and started the first underground feminist newspaper. And then eventually uh, we started at first, you know, there's many feminists out in the world of political, the playing fields of life, which I bless every one of them. And I'm part of that. But yet over time, some of us, had a longing for something else, some sort of image of a divine female. And that's led us to the goddess too. So that is, I just want to say that's a thread of my life between doing the TV series, many other actions, many other things that I've done, belonging to a coven, my coven nemesis since the 1980s. Um, And then writing my She Linda Gig book. So that's, that's the thread of my life is to serve the great mother. Can you fill in a little bit of the gap for me between driving over the Bay Bridge and starting a feminist newspaper? Well, there isn't really a gap. I, well, okay, I went, there, <laughs> I went there and I got involved in a CR or consciousness raising group. This is the late sixties. And of course that was a very um, of the times occurrence. And it was part of the, uh, second wave of feminism of women sitting in a circle talking about their lives, very simple, very profound. And we came to our own. It was the most natural place for me to be. And from that, I met some other women and then we lived together and one of the women had a printing press and we started It Ain't Me, Babe. And first publication was in 1970 where we were storming Harmon Jim on the Berkeley campus because we wanted to have karate lessons because we wanted to defend ourselves against male violence. And at that time, there, women weren't allowed in the karate classroom at, right. at Berkeley? That's wow. Right. You know, I think that's why it's so important um, for these kind of cross-generational discussions, because I'm in my 40s. I don't want to out you, but I believe you're in your early 70s. In my heart, I'm eternally young, but okay. Eternally young, yes. But just in terms of the, 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 the worlds that we grew up in, a lot of our listeners are in their 20s. So they can't even fathom a space where women wouldn't be allowed into a, a dojo. You know, that, that's how it was then. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I mean, again, for our younger listeners, like this, this is the world that our our mothers, sometimes our grandmothers grew up in. I know my mother told me she had, I think, three or four choices. She could be a housewife, a secretary, a teacher, or a nurse. And you'll find that all of her friends from that time either became teachers, you know, mothers, (laughs) secretaries, nurses. And for for young women who are young people who are listening to this podcast now, I, I really 
appreciate star you bringing this voice of a time where you and your sisters were fighting for the things that we take for granted yes and of course the fight still goes on because the longest war is the war on women and the war on women continues there's a war on nature there's a war on imagination there's the war on women which is the basis of all these other wars women um we know with the rising of the me too movement uh and we know that bless his heart jimmy carter said that the greatest violence was the violence against women and he was going to devote the rest of his life to fight that violence. I want to come back to something that you just said that I, I really would love for you to expand on the war on imagination. Okay. Well, you know, images create, Cosmological images reinforce and create political systems. And of course, we live in a patriarchy. And this is a change, too, for all my younger sisters. Just the fact that these words like patriarchy are introduced into the zeitgeist. Uh, So the rise of the goddess is, to me, part of the, the most important psychic event of our times, which is the return of the goddess. It's as if life itself, this is long-winded, but I'm getting there, it's if life itself or earth or the psyche had to have this rising up, this eruption of images of the goddess to restore balance to our out of out of balance world. So now we have these other cosmological images of a divine female, a female with, you know, that represents our creativity and our power and our sexuality. So this changes the political systems and this changes the idea of um of our morality in a way so we've had a war on the imagination where uh the sacred body of the goddess was evil and we're trying to say no it's sacred so instead of demonizing the female we're sanctifying it and that is a huge shift in terms of an image, and that is a war on the imagination because sacred images come from the deepest, most transformative parts of ourselves that have a bridge between the inner and the outer. But, you know, when we're just bombarded with superficial images in in our virtual world, then we're very disconnected and fragmented. And also one of the strongest uh cosmological images now is the war god it's god the father so this is this is an image that needs to be dethroned with the sanctity of all of life which is the great mother and is this why you focused on art and artists in your tv show I did because what could be more fun <laughs> to talk about <laughs> art you know and creativity so that's that's all I'm saying is You know, the oppression starts on many different levels. Yes, there's all these economic systems, but there's all these things are reinforced in that. That's why we need the image of the goddess is to sanctify ourselves on every level. Now, you obviously the the idea of um, the the goddess is is um, as a as a visual concept is up for an artist's interpretation. But there's one specific thing that you've written a lot about. I have your book in front of me, which is the Sheila Nagig. Can you give like sort of a? Uh, you said you apologize for being long winded before. I prefer long winded. So right. can you can All you right. give me a long winded explanation of what a Sheila Nagig is for our listeners who have okay. never heard this? Sheila Nagigs, and you can Google them and see many many images of them, which is new now. You know, in in the um, electronic world that we're in, mm. it, Sheila Nagigs are images of supernatural females exposing their vulvas on medieval Christian churches between the 12th and 17th century, churches in the British Isles and Ireland. And they are ferocious figures uh, with uh, huge capacious vulvas that they're pulling open their vulva lips, and they're usually centered in the body of a hag. So what are these images doing of this ferocious often bald, hag, desiccated body with a huge, ripe vulva exposing their vulvas on these churches. What are they doing there? So when I first saw the image in the 80s, 
I was mesmerized by it because the beauty and power of that image. So that became a sacred pleasure for me to to research the Sheilas and to travel all over Ireland and the British Isles and Scotland and Wales to 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 walk the ground that they were created on and to um, I don't want to say make sense, but to let the image uh, penetrate to me where and take me where no words could take me to a feeling level because the Sheilas again are a sacred image and they're what do I want to say? They're symbols of what? You know, they're images of life and death, death wielder, life giver. What is this image? What does she represent? How does it make me feel? Why did these people put them up there? So that was what my book is about. And you you go from this original, I don't want to say original because who knows where, you know, we, we both are familiar with Maria Gimbutas and, and sure. Paleolithic you know, vulva shapes in art, but I'll say original because this is our jumping off point. You go from this original 12th century and then into, there's a picture here of a 17th century uh, Bimson temple display figure that is very, very reminiscent of the Sheila Nagig um, in Kathmandu. And then later, <laughs> it, it, later in the book, you also include, you know, um, women in vulva costumes at, at women's marches. So how do you see the world reflecting these, these images? Is, is this all part of this great goddess awakening that we're searching for? <laughs> I just want to comment what you were talking about is Code Pink, Women for Peace. In the 19, uh, 2012 Republican convention, they dressed in vulva costumes and said, read my lips in the war on women. So it was vulva theater. It, it's just so delightful. <laughs> and, and the police stopped and had their pictures taken with these women. Anyway, I just love that. But to step back, what, what I'm saying um, my original title for my book was In Pursuit of an Image, but the publishers changed that. What I'm saying is sacred display of the vulva is a universal archetype. It's a pattern of energy steep in our psyche. And to me, it's the cosmological foundation of the human imagination. So I started with the image of the Sheilas, which are medieval European figures. And I traced them back through Celtic goddesses, through... Uh, classical goddesses like Balbo and Medusa, back to the Neolithic frog goddess, and then back to the Paleolithic caves, the origins of European art and religion. Uh, I'm not saying that there aren't symbolic imagery going further back, but this was a concentrated explosion of the human imagination. And one of the most predominant images in the caves were incised vulvas. So it took me back to these roots and I fell in love with the Paleolithic cave. So I was tracing the energies of the vulva back. And then I started to look at it. If it's an archetype, then it's something in every human psyche. And then I looked at it worldwide, all over the world. Kali is a display figure, really. Uh, there's figures in Oceania, in Africa, in South America, North America. So I started to see the universal aspect of the sacredness of the displayed vulva. And to me, it's just one of my later talks that have come out of my book. Uh, the icon of the vulva is a basis of civilization. How's that for a cosmological image? Build a culture around that. So that's that's where it all led. And that's where it is now. And I think that's part of the zeitgeist of now is that because uh, you were asking me before how I got involved with the goddess or how it came to me. I just was tuned into the zeitgeist. It was all rising up. And now we have words like vulva and vagina and pussy coming, you know, and reclaiming those words. And so we have that all part of the spirit of our times. And what I really want women to know is that there's a tremendous natural history that's available to them. And I, for me, that's why I think my book came out at this perfect time, that what is, what is the quintessential image of the power of the goddess? It's the vulva, so that we have a symbol to hold on to, to know um, the, the greatness and vastness and depth of our natural sacred history, our true heritage. 
I want to uh, bring up another sort of contemporary example. I'm going to read you a a little bit of uh, an article from just this year, January of this year. A 33-meter, you probably heard about this star, um, a 33-meter reinforced concrete vulva has sparked a backlash in Brazil with supporters of the country's far-right president clashing with left-wing art admirers over the installation. The handmade sculpture entitled Diva was unveiled by visual artist Julia Notari on Saturday at a rural park on the grounds of a former sugar mill, so on and so on. In a Facebook post, Notari said the Scarlet Hillside vulva was quote, intended to question the relationship between nature and culture in our phallocentric and (laughs) anthropocentric Western society and provoke debate over the problematization of gender. Now, I found this particularly interesting, especially knowing that I was going to be talking to you, um, that this backlash happened because I personally grew up near the CN Tower in Toronto, which is one of the more obviously phallic (laughs) landmarks in Canada. I mean, if you look at the CN Tower, it has a shaft and a head. It really is like a a giant penis in the center of Toronto. So, I mean, I wonder if you can get into like being surrounded by these phallic structures, not recognizing them to be phallic and then demonizing these sort of vulvic structures. Well, I think we know they're phallic. You know, a lot goes on beneath the surface. And whether we actually articulate that as phallic, I think our bodies know and our unconscious knows what the score is. Okay, we know what the score is. And I just think it's part of the zeitgeist of our times to have these other forces coming up, as I said the return of the goddess because we need her for our survival. Like I said, earth or the life force itself is returning us. And I've seen that um, piece in Brazil and it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's a big red vulva. And she had men and women were working on it. It is, it is a striking original piece. And so I think that patriarchy cast a spell on us and we're still just popping the bubbles of that spell and, and coming to realize what the toxic soup that we've been living in. And we're, we're, we're waking up, you know, Adrian Rich had a essay, when we dead awaken, you know, we're waking up to it. I think, I think in many ways, women know the score and they're becoming more aware of it. Yeah. And I mean, the uh, the agency sort of has to come because, I mean, as of, you know, 100 years ago, women weren't allowed to own property, weren't allowed or to vote. or vote or even, you know, a woman. I don't in Canada, I think a woman can get a credit card in her in her own name until the 70s. I'll double check that. But later than like, that. Later than that. Yeah. 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 So now that women are allowed to own things and make things I think it's inevitable that we're going to be seeing uh, uh, something something coming up that's you know uh, in opposition to this sort of phallic landscape that patriarchy has created yeah and I was just reading the other day because of that you know centenary of the hundred years of us voting in the 19 getting the vote in the 1920s which women fought for endless ceaseless struggle to get that Uh, so then they started passing other laws like women couldn't go in certain places or you know there were many things they couldn't do unless they were married so and again it was the second wave of feminism with the feminist mystique and other forces that happened in in the 60s now of course we have the first woman vice president first black asian woman black president so things are things are changing but of course there's such a backlash, like uh, when we had the first black president. So then we have this backlash of uh, all this white supremacy. So, yeah. But, you know, when I think of the pandemic, it shows the the connectedness of us all. And it shows what a completely unstable system patriarchy is that it shows that these social systems can't really handle things i mean all this violence and wars and gun manufacturers and assault on mother earth it shows that 
the way we're living can sustain itself. And it shows how connected we all are. And that is one of the missing values, of course, of patriarchy is uh, the web of life and the sense of connectedness. And if we're all children of the great mother, then we all belong here and have the right to our own human parcel of life. A human parcel of life. What does your human parcel of life look like right now? Well, I'm sitting here looking at the screen. (laughs) As most of us are. (laughs) I'm looking at the candles of all the candle I have that I got from Glastonbury Goddess Conference last summer where I gave a talk. I'm looking at my books. I'm just sitting in my studio. Is that what you mean physically? Right now, that's where I am. Or do you mean what's my life like now? I mean both, everything. Well, you know, as an introvert who's very happy to be in her room in some ways, <laughs> I was, the pandemic wasn't so hard for me, except for the fear and missing my friends and the suffering of my fellow human beings. Uh, in terms of deaths, in terms of sickness, and in terms of economic fragility and and the terror of not having a place to live. So uh, I'm looking that, and I'm looking to hope, of course, that things get better. I mean, I'm very happy, of course, that Trump lost um, the election. And I am teaching my classes. I teach literature classes. I'm teaching my classes all online. And I'm doing my creative work. And, you know, spring is coming. Spring is tomorrow. My coven will be meeting via Zoom. We'll have our annual, you know, we'll have our spring ritual, our spring equinox ritual on Sunday. And can you tell me more about your coven and, and what your practice looks like within that coven? Well, our coven is Nemesis. We picked a goddess, you know, not not Aphrodite frolicking through the sward, but not that I'm against love or frolicking <laughs> through the sward. But <clears throat> Nemesis began in the 80s, and we got together, and all the women in the coven are artists. And we, I think that one of the wondrous things about Nemesis is that we've endured to be together through through all of that, through um, through the tinctures of time, through through births, deaths, marriages, uh, art projects, all kinds of ceremonies that we mark the passage of our lives, and also, of course, connected to the wheel of the year. The thing is, if you're in a circle, and of course, I'm never against anybody being a, a solitary practitioner, being a solitary type myself, but there's a power in the circle. It, of course, it's really fundamentally changed my life to have a circle that you can draw on the love and power of that. It's a very um, stabilizing and empowering force. So we've been together a long time and gone through a lot of things. Like the woman who helped with all the illustrations of my book, Ruth Ann Anderson, she's my coven mate. And as I said, we're all artists and creative people. And it's it's one of the greatest forces in my life. And the fact that we've endured, you know, two of our coven mates have died. We've had other people come in. So it's all part of the ever-changing life force. Yeah. And I love this idea of a coven as being a place where you can draw power. Yes, you can draw on the love and power of the circle. I mean, that's what the consciousness raising uh, circles were, sitting in a circle and talking. There's nothing more powerful than that. That's all you need is to sit in a circle. Light a candle, be quiet, talk. Yeah, we talk, obviously, this is a podcast. So we we talk a lot about that sort of the healing art of telling your story and listening to other people's stories and how, like you say, just being in a circle, whether it's d- digital, virtual, or or in person, um, there's, there's very much a healing and a resistance involved there. 
Yes. Yes. And then, you know, you're dealing with other human beings. And of course, we've been together a long time. In 1989, we were on the cover of the LA Weekly. Do you know that publication? I have heard of it for sure. Really one of the biggest at that time, underground newspapers. And we were on the cover called The Witches Next Door. Did you, can you tell me again what year you said that was? I, I need to look 19, it was it, it was 1988 or 1989. Yeah, I'll find it. <laughs> Bless the internet. God has blessed the internet. I want to see it's that. It's wonderful. I mean, every light casts a shadow, but you can do so much research. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing to me. I still, you know, as someone who's been lived, well, we've all been living with the internet for the same amount of time, but um, you and I were lucky enough to sort of have a, a pre-internet life and a post-internet life. So we yeah. can really appreciate, like, we had to go digging through card catalogs in, <laughs> and we had to physically go to the library, ask a librarian, so much love for librarians out there as always. And that was the... Yeah. That was the only game in town for getting information. And now I'm still amazed every day that I can just go onto this little box in my house and have the world. Fantastic. You know, when I was doing my Sheila gig research, some of it was in the 1990s and I had to go to the Royal Irish Academy and I was connected to archaeologists because I was friends with Maria Gimbutas, but I had to fill out all these forms and, I mean, what I had to go through just to be able to go and do research in that library. And I spent days Xeroxing journals of um, antiquarian, royal antiquarian journals that had all this information about the Sheilas in the 19th century when uh, antiquarians were cataloging the Sheilina gigs. Now I can go, because I'm a professor, I can go to JSTOR and in one second have access to every one of those journals. Yeah. And I, I really just don't want our young listeners to take that for granted. Like if you can keep the wonder and amazement of imagination every time you use the internet that people like Star and I have, then I it's, think it's, it's like waiting. Of course, there's endless distractions, you know, but everything has its pros and cons, the light, exactly. the shadow. <laughs> <laughs> so since we're talking about young witches, can you tell me what you think is the next step in serving the goddess in in the future as we go forward? Well, I don't know, but I think just continuing this awareness and this breaking through of of female sacred power. I think it's something that's happening. I, I, I think it's tuning in. It's tuning into something that's already there. I mean, the goddess has always been there. She's just been suppressed. Or now she's emerging to save life, really, I think, to save the planet. So I think it's just tuning in. And I, I just want women to know the immense natural heritage i mentioned this before the sacred powers of the vulva and their body and that really it's one of the longest and most enduring images the sacredness of the vulva and all all that that represents in terms of of life death and regeneration for women to know who and what they are and i think that that's going to be coming more and more and more the sacredness of of who we are and the or like I said, the origins of art and spirituality. And that's why I think the symbol of the vulva is so immense. Again, because the symbol penetrates into our body and and takes us to the feeling nature of reality. So I think still working, you know, on all levels, working to to quit having uh hideous poisons, toxins sprayed on our food. I live in California, and if you drive up the Central Valley, all you see these huge agribusinesses taking all the water and making food that's really inedible. Um, so fighting for, for the reclamation of our planet on all levels, I think, I think that is something that is a completely foremost. And, and having a vision of connection and the sanctity of all life. I mean, I'm hoping that we're on the cusp of a huge change, a huge change in our political systems 
and you know the the breaking down of corporate power which has become so great i mean people didn't have that sense of the one percent now or the uh the oligarchy and i think things are people are becoming more aware and maybe trump and all that was the last gasp of of those political structures there's still a lot to do so that's what i would want to say is keep fighting for life keep fighting for life and I, I really pleasure like, in life. Maybe fighting is too militaristic, but keep keep taking delight in life and serving life. Yeah, I think there's there's room enough in our universe for fighting and taking yeah. pleasure for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just again I want to thank you because you know I discovered your work. Um, as a result of the Missing Witches Project. One of our taglines is, uh, we go looking for the witches we've been missing. Exactly. And certainly, Star Goody, you uh, are, were one of those and no longer missing. I just really want to thank you for being a role model for what I think the Missing Witches Project is, which is, again, like uncovering these these histories that have been suppressed, not just, you know, forgotten, but intentionally suppressed. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Yeah. So again, I mean, this is just me sort of giving you gratitude um, for for starting this work. Um, do you know if there are any copies of It Ain't Me, Babe on the internet? I really don't know. I mean, I have old copies, but I, I actually don't know. I mean, they wrote a book. There was a book on about uh, radical newspapers of the 60s and 70s, and we're in that. But Go ahead. That actually, I should look up that too. Yeah, <laughs> we have the technology to make these searches so much easier, but and yet still, we have to go hunting. We have to go looking to find these names. You know, in, in terms of our occult studies, um, Risa, that's my podcasting partner, and I. You know, we're we were much more likely to have heard of Al Alistair Crowley or Ger Gerald Gardner, mm -hmm. and then to discover this like, sort of legion of women who had, you know enhanced their work only to be given no credit for it did you ever like Dion fortune yeah she's she, i have read some of her work and she is on my list for next season in fact you have to read the novel sea priestess that's my favorite sea priestess i'm writing it down she did a you know she did occult books on uh the kabbalah and different things and wrote about avalon but she also wrote these wonderful novels and she lived in Glastonbury. Mm -hmm. And you said you were just there? Not just well, there. Well, I was going to be there, there yeah. but because of the pandemic, it was all on Zoom. Yeah. Do you, um, do you have any tours planned for the future for hopefully when we're all vaccinated and free to roam? Well, the place that I really want to go is the Paleolithic Caves. I want to go to the south of France and Spain because I became mesmerized by the beauty and wonder of the caves that our ancestors, how, how 40,000 years ago that they could write this, do this, not write, but carve and make these, this artistry. And through my connections in the goddess world, I found a woman who wrote a book on <clears throat> the pit. She would be the perfect tour guide for me. And uh, I mean, I, I couldn't stand if I went to a cave and some man said, Oh, this is about hunting magic. We're in the womb of the goddess for Gotta say, <laughs> mm -hmm. but that's my biggest travel dream is to go to the Paleolithic caves and be where they were, our our ancestors. Yeah, because you you brought up something that that Maria Gimbutas discussed, um, which is part of that suppression was that these sort of like uterus you know, triangular vulvic forms were then decided that they were uh, ram's heads, that they were, they were war, like you're saying, like they, that they were these sort of masculinist symbols. Oh, please. Oh, please. Um, you know, uh, in some of the caves, there's images of the vulva and the uterus and there's, um, and the, the, patriarchal interpretation was oh look there was a, a, a there's a there's an arrow by it it's a weapon of war and what it was was the sprouting new life because of course the vulvas were generative and 
And this was a motif that carried all the way through the Neolithic and the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. But again, you can't see it. They can't see it because of that interpretation of everything is war, war, war. And that was the thing about Maria that changed my life the first time I heard her talk in 1985 when she said, we've lived in peace. You know, the, it's not an indelible quintessence of humanity to be at war. We had, there were times we lived in peace. So there's just so many things like in the, so that changed my life. Yeah. The day that gives you hope. Yeah. And so validating to think like, you know, it is possible. It is possible. Maria taught me that, that it was at least possible to live yes. in peace. And one other thing is sort of tangential, but in doing my research, um, you know, it's always thought you see these pictures of the Paleolithic Leonardo painting all the cave paintings and and it's thought because of some of the imprints of the hand that maybe really it was this was a national geographic but maybe it's really women who did a lot of that artwork so you know it, it's just we've been we're just been poisoned by the toxic spell of patriarchy that wow. as i said is a very violent unstable system and cannot stand <laughs> I'm sure you've probably encountered uh, Great Cosmic Mother by Monica Show and Barbara sure, Moore. Sure. And one of the mind blowers in there for me, and this is me having been raised by a feminist mother as a feminist my whole life. But um, in that book, there's something along the lines of like, of course, women, you know, invented language. You know, mm -hmm. if you think of hunter and gatherer, the hunters, they had to be stealth. They had to be quiet. They would maybe point. But the gatherers had to say, these berries made my family sick. This, you know, there had to be, of course, women invented language. And that kind of blew my mind because, of course, we were not taught that. Well, right. <laughs> you know, it's it's just so evil. Um, I don't know if you know Genevieve Vaughn, her work that, about the gift economy and <clears throat> the sacred bonds of between mothers and children. I mean, doesn't it make sense that women were communicating with their children in that intimate bond, let alone inventing agriculture and everything? Yeah, pottery. Yeah. Cooking food. <laughs> so of course, of course, that would be, you know, um, language of course yeah. it would be um because that's the gift of language is i mean when you start with your mother yes and that voice exactly and we can extend that idea to a goddess how whatever form she may take in our imaginations well you know your mother is your first goddess mm -hmm. i'm not saying mothers i'm not saying every mother is perfect but whatever <laughs> oh god no we know that <laughs> But mothering wherever you find it, that nurturing. Yeah, that's something for me um, as someone who is childless. I don't like to use the word infertile because I think of my fertility as being not solely linked to my reproductive yeah. abilities. <laughs> but yeah, that, you know, I can I can be a mother to anyone that I encounter. That's right. That's right. And. You know, there's a lot of people in the world. We, don't, if you don't want to have children, or if you can't, everybody should be free. Yeah, everybody should be free. Again, I want to thank you so much for contributing to this awakening that you're describing. I think that um, it's not only supernatural; it is down to the work that people like you and Marie Gimbutas and Monica Show and Mayumi Oda and all of these people have been doing for all of these years to make sure that these images are no longer suppressed, that they are a part of our zeitgeist. I really just want to give you so much gratitude. Thank you. You can't see me, but I'm, I'm bowing. Thank you. <laughs> and I bow to you, star goody. Is there anything else you think our listeners, like it's important for them to know either about you or the goddess or, or life in general before we wrap it up for today? Well, I'm no sage, but I just want women to know the immense sacredness of their natural heritage. It's, it's tremendous. And women need to know where they came from. Women really know, need to know this, have divine, sacred images of their body. And that's the goddess. 
the demeaning of women's bodies has and always has been a lie. Right. A lie. Of course. Yeah. Listeners, you are sacred. Take it from Star Goody, the great sage. <laughs> the great the great reluctant sage. <laughs> Thank you again, Star. It's been an absolute joy talking with you. And I hope that this is a relationship that will carry on. Maybe we'll visit those caves in France together someday. That sounds like a great delight to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And if our listeners want to get in touch with you, how can they buy your book? How can they support you? Go to www.stargoody.com. That's 10 letters, S-T-A-R-R-G-O-O-D-E, stargoody.com. Perfect. And my email's there and everything's there. Yeah. And if you just want to check out um, some of Star's work, again, thank you, Star, for putting those um, episodes of The Goddess in Art on YouTube for us to enjoy for free. And also, I really recommend listeners that you pick up a copy of Sheila Na Gig. That's three words, Sheila Na Gig by Star Goody. Thanks again, Star, so much. My pleasure. You must be a witch. If you want to support The Missing Witches Project, you can do so by buying our book, reviewing it on Amazon and Goodreads, using offer code MISSINGWITCHES when you shop at Foxglove Farm, become a Patreon patron, or pick up some Missing Witches merch at TeePublic.